Not the worst place in the world. Alright. Don't mind me. 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 Don't Of course, Ellie is blinking. Oh, Ellie. That one's good. I have to get another because mine, Ellie's looking down. Where's that? Out of the way, Chloe. Out of the way, Chloe. Good morning and welcome to Skip Dress Back to Church. And it's Easter. It's Easter, you have risen. You've risen indeed. So you can stand with it. In your bulletin, you should have something. I'm working on it again. It looks like this. This will have all the words, most of the words are correct in there, so we'll find a couple songs to change a few things. And uh, so, anyway, so this will have the music for you, and uh, we're going to start off with Living in the We got a moment of silence here, but it's cold. I take care of it. One day when heaven was filled with sadness, one day when sin was as dark as the peace, Jesus came forward to be born out of the night. Let us not make it simple, it's here. The word became flesh, yeah. The light shined among us, His glory revealed. And living in the dying and saving, buried, buried, my sins fall away. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, we're going to another glorious day. And uh, so, here we go.
also, uh, if you're a guest with us, I invite you, you should have a bulletin, and if you'll just tear off this sign, tell us who you are and all that good stuff, just put that in the basket. And if you have an offering this morning, uh, just because of COVID and that, we're not willing to pass plates this morning, but if you're to take that and drop it in that little basket, it looks like an Easter basket. And uh, Brother Robert, you can't take anything out of it. And so, uh, but you can put it in. And so, please put your visitor card and any gift or offering that you have to the Lord in there. And uh, as you're leaving, you can drop it in there. And uh, so, thank y'all for being here this morning. And uh, you are welcome to stand again with us. If you don't want to, that is fine, but we're going to continue worshiping. And uh, so here we are going to sing how great God is. Yeah. 
Bibles, rather, to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 10, and then we're going to sneak over to chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. Oh, that was good. We're in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 through 10. And we're going to talk about a couple of things. What does it mean to have faith in Christ? And if we're a believer, what are believers supposed to do? And more importantly, how do you live a good life now? We've heard books about it. But how do you live a good, and I don't mean like living large and having everything that you've wanted, living the American dream, but living a good life, a godly life. Is that possible? How do you do it? And we're in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, and the point we're looking at is God's gift of new life. And if you're not familiar, if you have your bulletin, you can flip it on the back, and I actually have a little bit of my outline there. And uh, so you can fill that in. So we're in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 to 10. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk, walk in them. So what God gives us is he gives us a new life. And what does that new life entail? Okay. First off, it entails the forgiveness of sin. Okay, look back up. For you are saved by grace through faith. Grace is a gift. That's the root word, charis. It's God's gift to you. What is God's gift? Being saved. Salvation. Brother Reagan, what is salvation? I'm so glad that you asked. Salvation, what do you need to be saved from? Well, have you ever lied? Have you ever disobeyed your parents? Have you ever taken something that wasn't yours? Well, no, brother. I bet you did in the nursery when you were little. And someone had a toy and you took it and said, mine. That's a sin nature. And as we get older, it doesn't go away, does it? 
And we need help from that. The wages of sin is death, a separation from God forever. But God did something for us that we celebrate on Easter weekend. Is Jesus died on Friday and took all of man's sin, all the way from Adam and Eve to the last person, took all that weight on himself. And when he died, sin died with him. And when he resurrected, death died too. And he purchased for us a, a, an escape. A, that's what salvation is. It's we lived in death. We were separated from God because of our trespasses and sins. But Jesus said, look, if you believe in me, then you, the one who believes in me has crossed over from death into life. It's, it's a forgiveness of sin and a new nature that he gives to us. And how does he give that to us? We have to admit that we're sinners. We have to believe in what God did for us, but we have to confess our faith in Him. We have to trust Him. We have to believe in Him. And when we do that, then God says that He will save us. So that faith that we have, that we impart, is what our part is, or as I like to say, it's our gift to God. We're no longer going to depend on ourselves we're no longer live our lives depending on what we understand and what we know, but we're going to turn to him in faith and begin to follow him. But he, Paul says in Ephesians 9, 2.9, he says, it's not from what you have done, but it's what he has done so that nobody can boast. And then in verse 10 he says, and this is interesting, we're going to camp out here a little bit, for we are his creation. We are his creation. We get the word poem from this word. I don't know if you've ever written one or you were <clears throat> forced to write one in English class. Anybody, anyway, we don't talk about that. Bad memories, bad memories. Poema, poema is the word. It's that which is made. It's a product. It's the result of someone doing something. And uh, we are his creation. Some of your Bibles may say we are his workmanship or that we were created. That is actually a word that is uniquely used in Genesis. It only speaks of the divine action in creation. But it's speaking of salvation. And so this is a new thing that God is doing in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, kind of pieces, same word, a new species. It's a new kind of man. Okay, and this is what he's talking about, Paul's talking about here. He said, look, we are new creatures. Okay, and, and it's not what you are doing for yourself. It was what God has done for you and to you. It's not something that you are able to do. Well, I'm going to start living a better life and I'm going to change my ways. And... No, you need help. And that's what Easter is about. It's about salvation and us coming to God and him helping us to making us new and alive. To do what? It tells you in the verse, created in Christ Jesus for what purpose? For good works. For good works. You ever talk to someone, how are you doing? Well, I'm good. What kind of good are we talking about? We're talking about the goodness of God and His goodness to us. Brother Reagan, what do you mean? Let's take a little breath. You take that for granted, don't you? You take for granted that the oxygen levels are just exactly what you need in order to be alive. And you take for granted that your, your heart does its job and your lungs do their job. And you, you begin to not take those things for granted when they don't work right. And all those things were designed and made for you. God could have, well, that, you know, Brother Reagan, he's going to be bad, so I'm going to mess him up a little. No, God's not that way. God's good to everybody. All of his goodness is seen around in all of his creation and all of his nature. When you look at the stars, not only do you see his goodness, but you see his order and his majesty and his power. 
what God desires to do in salvation is he wants to put that goodness in you. So that you would go and act the same way that he does. In the, that he prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them. It's a continuity of action. That You wouldn't just do good one time. A lot of times we look, I've actually had people ask me, Brother Reagan, what's the minimum amount that I have to do to be saved? <laughs> you know, what do I, listen, well, you know, well, what's the minimum amount that you had to do to be alive? Well, you didn't do anything. You were just born. And that's what salvation is, being born again. But imagine just living your life doing absolutely nothing from birth to death. Purposeless. It's the same thing in salvation. You weren't born just to sit there. You were reborn for good works, and not just one or two, but a continuous lifestyle of goodness to people. God created believers to go about doing good works. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, maybe some other people, but you haven't seen what God's got to work with right here. You don't know my past. You don't know what I think. You don't know what I do, where I've been. You know, you know, Brother Reagan, you know, you, you're a preacher's kid and you, you can do something. You, you, don't, you don't know where I've been. God couldn't use me. Well, if God created believers to go about doing good works, how does that work? Ephesians chapter 4. So we looked at God's gift of a new life, but we're talking about replacing that old life with your new life. See, just because you were born doesn't mean that everything's going to go happy-go-lucky for you, right? you got to do something with it. Amen? You just, you know, God gave you life, but he, do something. Don't just sit there. Okay? Do something. And so, but do the right things. Do good things, okay? Don't just do something. Do good things. And so Paul helps us out. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 is where, and I'm skipping a whole lot of good stuff. I encourage you to go home and read Ephesians 2. And read Ephesians 4. I'm, I'm skipping out a whole lot of stuff, but I figure you want to go home and eat Eastern lunch. So I'm just touching a little bit, but there's a lot of good stuff to eat on. So eat on that later after you finish your meal and you're thinking about falling asleep. Go read Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 2. It's a good read. So Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, verse 22, you took off your former way of life, the old self, that's corrupted by deceitful desires, and you are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. And you put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness, in righteousness and purity of the truth. So the first thing Paul tells us to do in verse 22 is to take off your former way of life or stop depraved behavior. Okay? The word in the Greek, and it's, it's hard to pronounce, I'm just not going to pronounce it, it's a P-H-T-H. Thero. It's weird. So to cause someone to become perverse or depraved as a type of moral destruction. Okay? What, what do you mean? But we talk about a sin nature a lot, but what does that mean? It's real simple. It's a, a real simple concept. I can have a pencil or something right here. And is that pencil bad? We've talked about this before. No, the pencil's not bad. Now, when I take it and throw it at you, is the pencil bad then? No. 
Reagan's bad. <laughs> See, the, everything that God made is good. Well, the internet's bad. This is bad. No, that, it's not bad. It's man that comes in and twists it. He takes it and he messes it up. That's what happens. And it's our nature that does it. We take a good thing and we twist it to something that God did not intend it to do. Remember, remember what God said about everything in creation? He looked at everything and he said, that's good. The man took it and it made it bad. And so God is trying to restore the original intent, which was goodness in us. So Paul says, look, once you become a believer, you still have to make a conscious effort to stop doing what you used to do. When I was lost, I don't know if you ever were like this, but my language was not always clean. And there were words that came out of my mouth that were not good. Now when I got saved, I went back to trying to do that stuff, and that didn't work out. There was someone living inside of me pushing me to do the good things. And just to let you know, my tongue wasn't the only problem that I have or had. There were many other things in my life that God had to begin to clean up. And the way that we begin to do that is the things that we know we ought not to do, stop them. And the things that you know you ought to do, do them. Because James tells you, if you know the good that you ought to do and you don't do it for you, that's sin. Well, how come all these other people can get away with that and I can't? Because you know better. That's why. <laughs> okay? Stop depraved behavior. There's another word there that talks about coveting in wrong actions. Uh, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. Wanting what other people have. And, you know, and maybe I would, you, know, you look and say, man, her dress is pretty. I wish I had that dress. And you, you just bought the real pretty dress yourself. But oh, I got to go out and get me a new one and be on sale tomorrow. And our deceitful desires, they deceive us. We, get, we have a thought, and then it blossoms into another thought. And all of a sudden we have, that happens with worry a lot. I don't know if you worry at all. Probably not. And it just, and it just all these fears. And does it really ever happen? No, but we spend days and weeks and months and years fretting over things to strongly desire what belongs to someone else, to engage in an activity which is morally wrong. Paul says, look, all of those desires, you need to, literally it says to take them off. It's like taking off a shirt or taking off a jacket. So these are things that before they dominated you, they weighed on you, but in Christ, you can remove these things. But you have to do it. God has given you the power and the authority to do it. But you have to make a conscious desire to do it. Well, then what would I do? I don't know what to do. Well, it tells you in the scripture. Verse 23. Being renewed in the spirit of your minds. Being renewed in the spirit of your minds. Are you around people that don't think the way that you think? Gentlemen, can we just kind of talk for a minute? Just between us ladies, just la la la. Are there times where your wife's talking to you and she's saying something, but you're not getting it? And vice versa? Parent, is there a time where you're telling your child something and it's just like there's no openings in their head that's getting into their brain? 
It's just not there. Or have you ever been so resolved to do something that 10 people told you not to do that? And you were so, it's a nice word, stubborn, is that a nice word? Hard-headed, resilient, that you did it anyway, despite the good advice and regretted it the moment you did it, the moment you said it? Paul says, you need to change the way that you think. And just like you had an old way of life, you have a new way of living, but you need to think that way. Okay? You need to think the way that God thinks so that you can do good things. Remember, what is the way Reagan thinks? Bad. Sinful. Ungodly. So I need to change the way that I think. Well, man... I wish there was something that could help me understand God's ways. I don't know. Maybe a book. A book that was, would explain his will and explain his ways and actually had some stories that talked about how God deals with people from the beginning of time until now. If you have a Bible in your hands, you're holding the book like that. The scriptures teach you the way God thinks. And if that's a little lacking of clarity, Jesus is the word of God, the living word of God. And so if you really don't understand it, you say, well, just give me something I can see. Well, just look at the life of Jesus. And if you don't like all that other stuff, just find a Bible that has everything that Jesus said and read and just read all that. You don't have to worry about all the rest of it. You have enough, enough challenge just trying to do everything that all the red stuff says. Because he tells you who God is and how you ought to be. And what he wants you to be is not perfect. He just wants you to be good. So he wants you to change the way you think. And so, you know, I have learned, it's been 25 years, and I'm starting to learn the way Ashley thinks. I'm not quite there yet. As Ashley's my wife, for those of you who don't know. So the only way that I come to understand, and sometimes she hears good. So sometimes she changes her thoughts. So i got to stay around her to keep up. Because I'm going to get in trouble either way. So I've got to keep up with her. It's the same way with God. Sometimes your thinking don't go the way he's thinking. And you're wrong. <laughs> so you need to keep up with him. The way you do that is daily reading your Bible and walking in what you understand and learn. So we took off something. We started to change the way we think. The last thing in verse 24, you put on the new self. It's the same word. So I take off that, that cloak of ungodliness, take off that old way of living, and I put on this new way of living putting on a new clothes, I take off the clothes of sin, I put on the robes of righteousness. Okay? Put on God's new man. This new species of person that he created me to be. And I want to point out something to you. How was it created? Look at it. According to God's likeness. So who are, you, who are you able to be like? God. Or John said in 1 John, that we know that we have believed him, that we love him if we live as he lived. Yeah, that's a bold statement. How, how do I live like Jesus? Well, first, you got to quit living like you. Stop living in an ungodly way. Start learning a new way to act and act that way. Like God in righteousness, by doing the right things, and then the purity of the truth. 
Have you ever done the right thing and done it grudgingly? You know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like when I get my sister really good, and I've been planning it for sometimes minutes, sometimes days. And it, well, I don't say that. Okay, I don't want to tell on myself too much. And I and I got on her. I got her. Man, I'm like yes. And then I got caught. And then my parents said, "Tell her you're sorry." Sorry. Well, I'm smiling because I wasn't sorry at all. The purity of the truth and true righteousness and holiness. Meaning not only that I do the right things, but God begins to change my heart so I do the right things for the right reasons. That I, I do things not because they're the right thing to do and I don't want to look bad, but because I want to please my Heavenly Father. Not because I'm trying to earn brownie points or get an extra star in my crown, but because I love Him. Because He loves me. And how do I know that He loves me? Because while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. That's how we know. Not while we were doing the good, but while we were doing the bad. And knowing my need of, of being able to come out of a grave, being able to come out of death, He died for me and resurrected for me so that I could cross over into a new life, not to live on my own, but to live with Him and He with me. And that's what salvation is. And that's true resurrection life is having God living in you by faith in Jesus Christ. Do you have that? It's just like in any relationship. I can go to a person and tell them I'm sorry, but they have to forgive me. And understand this, God is just not some cosmic force that's impersonal, but He knows every single hair on your head and counts them. He has complete knowledge of every single thing that you've done, every single thing that you've said, every thought that never came out. And with a pure heart, He loves you. And He also knows you. So have you come before the God that knows you? and bowed the knee and made him the Lord of your life. Have you done that? When you do that, his spirit comes to live in you and you begin to walk in newness of life. It is the spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh does not help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. John 6, 63. The way we come to the Father is through the Son, by trusting in Him, making Him our Lord and our Savior. And we have to leave away the old life, take it off, and put on the new one, renewing our minds each day through His Word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your death on the cross, paid the penalty of our sins. Thank you for the resurrection from the dead that liberates us from the bondage of sin and death and gives us life. Lord, give us grace this morning. Help us to choose you. Love you, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and you want to receive Christ and you don't know how. It's real simple. 
in the words I'm about to say, you can just repeat them in, from a pure heart and an honest prayer. Because you're not talking to me, you're not repeating my words, you're talking to God and confessing. Say, Lord Jesus, I know I've wronged you. I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. And I want to give you my life. I ask you to forgive me and be my Lord. Save me. Thank you. Amen. Real simple prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's your yielding of your spirit to him, making him the Lord of your life. Would you stand with me, please? You're welcome to come. I'd love to lead you in a prayer. Maybe God's dealing with you about some things. Maybe there's some things that you old things that you need to lay down. You can do it in your seat. You're welcome to come up here. I'll pray with you. Whatever God's leading you to do. Maybe there's some new things you need to do. Maybe you know you ought to come to church and today's a new day. Come next Sunday. We're here. We won't be here. We'll be over there. He who knows the good he ought to do. Doesn't do it. Not good. What's God asking you to do this morning as we sing? Or play? Come. The gospel that they have received. We bless you. We love you. We thank you for today. In Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.